Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ. I, uh, I was at Goodwill yesterday with the, with the kids, all three of them. I'm, I'm a hero, I know. <laughs> and, uh, and I was looking for a full-size adult Batman costume because I was going to come in here rocking the Batman costume. Unfortunately, they don't make Batman costumes in hero size. <laughs> So I, I wasn't able to do that. But for the children, I was basically going to wear the Batman costume and ask you who I was. And of course, the children would say, Batman. you're Batman. I'd be like, how do you know that I'm Batman? Because you're in the uniform. Because I'm in the uniform. I'm wearing a Batman costume. And then the obvious follow-up is, how do people know that we are Christians? We don't have a uniform. So that takes us back to our, our text from this morning, this, this wedding feast text. And I'd like to read, I think I'd like to read the entire thing again. And, uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, so we are in, in Matthew chapter 22, uh, reading verses 1 through 14. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of God may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. They paid no attention, and they went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find, and those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in and looked at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So as I'm unpacking this this week, I'm seeing some similarities, and I'm compelled to look back into Acts chapter 13. And, and in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are at Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jews. And the, the Jews are kind of front and center. But then, just within earshot, right outside the main circle here, there are Gentiles and people that are not, that are not Jewish. Okay, and the Jews respond one way, and the Gentiles and everybody else respond another way. A completely different way. So, if we're in Acts chapter 13... Verse 48 kind of illuminates that for us, and, and it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many were, were, and as, many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So we see in our parable this morning that the king has offered an invitation to his first choice. Okay, and so now, and it further shows us that this is an archetype for what's happened with, uh, with the spread of the gospel. It's spread, it's it attempted to spread to the Jews first, and it's getting this kickback. But then God says, or as as Paul shows here in his action, we're going to go ahead and and try to spread it to whoever will hear it and whoever will respond to it. If if you won't respond to it, that's fine. I'll go over here and 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 share the same invitation with, with these other people in the highways and the byways, the people that are, are, not, are, not, um, are not Jews. And so where at one point we saw the lines of social status 
and um, and religion really bind people into their appropriate buckets. We're seeing that totally disintegrated and eliminated now. That doesn't exist anymore. We're, it's totally destroying that. And for as much as that's important and that helps set us, set us up, I really want to focus on just a small piece of the entire text today. And that is the part um, that's verses 11 through 13. It says, but when the king came in and looked at the guests, he saw there a man, saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. When the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in a place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the interaction is short between the king, right? It's like one sentence and then no response. The guy's speechless. He has nothing to say to this king who is treating him like a friend initially. It wasn't like, I heard you, what are you doing? It was like, hey, friend, share with me what you're, what you're thinking right now and, and why, you're, why you're looking the way you do. And so for as short as this interaction is, it really illuminates at least three fundamental realities. And I'm going to go through those three fundamental realities here. Uh, the first is that being a Christian is not about self-identification. It is about Christ identification. I'm going to say it one more time. Being a Christian is not about self-identification. It is about Christ identification. Okay, so when we show up to this party as members of the byways and the highways, when the king's servants come to us and invite us to the party, when we show up to that party, we show up with nothing to wear. We show up with nothing to say. We show up with nothing to offer. We have nothing. In those days when, when there was a wedding like that, the, a, a wealthy king would provide that. He would provide the wedding garment. He would provide the food and the wine. and He would provide everything that was necessary to bring about his vision for this plan for this wedding. And so when people showed up, they often showed up maybe with a gift, but other than that, they were showing up to do what the, king, the, what the king wanted for this party. So when we talk about having nothing to wear, we're also talking about a, a spiritual sense. When, we sh when we're invited to this party, we're not bringing anything with us. We, we're all equalized under sin. We all show up um, in that sinful status. We're not, we're not clothed in righteousness. We don't, we don't, we're not bringing that. Uh, we have nothing to say, right? Because for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Prior to that invitation, we don't even have anything worth saying apart from Christ. And then we have nothing to offer. All the works that we have are filthy rags in his eyes. Prior to Christ, it's filthy. It's filthy rags. But the good news is is that everything we need to participate in this party is provided for us. Totally, completely, sufficiently. And I'm going to explain just how sufficiently we're provided for. So he provides appropriate attire, this, we this, this wedding garment. Where's your wedding garment? Well, let's talk about this wedding garment for a minute. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 to 13a. It says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Jesus. It doesn't sound like us. That sounds like Christ. We look like Christ. He provides us with this voice that we didn't show up with. Instead of failing to answer the king's question when he comes up to us and says, what are you doing here? Why are you dressed the way you're dressed? We no longer have that lack of truth. He gives us the information we need to be able to boldly proclaim, I am here under the blood of Christ. And he becomes what we offer. If we believe that and we boldly proclaim that, then we can offer that to the people around us. Other people are showing up. They're not wearing what they're supposed to be wearing, but we are. 
We can boldly proclaim, we can boldly share based on our experience with the king's greatness. So if we trust in his provision, we wear the robe, we show up with empty hands and let him provide for us the things that he desires in us, then we gain access to all of the joy and all of the peace that his presence has to offer. So that brings us to our second reality, and, and this one's a little, I think this one's a little more abrasive, it might be, but um, it's his party and they're his terms, right? He's throwing the party, he sets the terms. So if any one of you decided or you wanted to throw a, throw a birthday party or a, an anniversary party and the theme was uh, black tie, right? Everybody loves a black tie party and it's... You got the swanky four-string quartet and people are dancing and, and it's a beautiful thing. If somebody showed up to your party and was rocking a disco era suit, super lapels, like lapels out to here, would that person be would that person be right or would they be stepping on some toes? Right. They're not they're not conforming to the idea. Or to that, to that plan, to what's already happening around them. They're not, they're not taking that into consideration. So when you set the party, you get to set the rules. Now, it might be open for discussion, but in this case, it's not. <laughs> yes, in this case, it's not. They're, it's his party. They're his terms. And we don't get to make changes to the king's plan. Now, we can, we can walk away from it, but there are really only two responses to that. His plan is final. It's going to happen the way it is. We have two choices. We can either submit to that plan and conform to it and be changed by it, or we can resist it and walk away and not have any part of it. There's no really in between. And because it's his party, it's totally sufficient. It doesn't need to be replanned. It doesn't need to be revisited. It's sufficient. His invitation for grace, his invitation to the gospel is sufficient. And it's final. So that brings us to that final reality. And that is to put on Christ, this garment of Christ, is to put on Christ's mission. And purpose in this world. Those people were invited not just to look like they were at a wedding. Okay, it would be ludicrous for him to invite a whole bunch of people, do no preparation, and say, here, wear all these wedding garments and sit down over here on the side of the, side of the road. They're, the reason they were wearing the wedding garments was because they were at a wedding and were expect, expected to participate in that. It's not, here you go, here's everything you need to be in a wedding go on your way. No, it's you have these things so that you may. So if we put this stuff on, if we, if we try to participate by getting all of the benefits of the gospel, but we want none of the responsibilities, that's not, we're, we're working outside of the design. So to be clothed in Christ is to be identified with him. We look like Christ, remember? Those, those traits from from Colossians, to put them on, put on God, or as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness. You all said he, it looked just like Christ, so to put on this garment is to put on Christ, to look like Christ. If we look like Christ and are identified with Christ, then we love who Christ loves. We weep over the loss like Christ does. And we seek to conform to the will of the Father like Christ does. We don't just sit down in our wedding garment and and stare into space and wait for something to happen. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. Amen. So let's look at the, the hardest part of this whole text. And this took pretty, I think, the longest to, to research. And, and even Anne, as she's looking over it, she's like, Richard... <laughs> I'm like, but it's Bible, so we're just going to share it anyway. It's verse 14. It says, for many are called, but few are chosen. 
Many are called, but few are chosen. So are we talking about an exclusive club here? Are we talking about a, a, a platinum card membership versus the, the gold card membership? No, we're not. We're not talking about an exclusive club that has, uh, has or an exclusive club that has only an extent, extended an invitation to a select few whose credit meets the requirements or, or, or something like that. This invitation is extended to everybody. Many are called. It's available for, for everybody. This invitation counts for you and for everybody you know. The invitation is there. But the sad truth is, is that even though the invitation is there for everybody, only a few will show up, and even fewer will show up and be willing to change their clothes. And, and we see that. We see that in society. We see that in our governments. We see that in our neighborhoods. We see that in our churches. And people will show up to a wedding feast, but they're not going to change their clothes. That's why our mission as the Church of Christ is so important. For those of you that have put on those, that, that wedding garment, you put on some responsibility. You put on the responsibility to go out and be a member of this wedding party and to not only seek to help other people put that garment on, but to allow them to see the joy that you have. It's a wedding, it's a party, it's one, it's done. It can't be changed. But if you're wearing that, there's a responsibility to let other people know, that, to, to give a, a, a defense for the joy that you have inside of you. So the other kind of approach that was interesting that I thought was some of us get called in and we get changed, but then some of us get sent right back out. Someone's got to be those servants. The servants that the king sends, that's us too. And when we go out, the worst thing we can do is sugarcoat it and to say that it's something that it's not. Okay, there is only one gospel that can save. We have to be honest about that. And we don't add to it. The king's preparation is sufficient and it's complete. Everything needed for an awesome wedding feast, an awesome celebration of victory is provided. It's there. And we wear the king's robes. We wear the king's robes. If we are at the king's party, we wear the king's robes. And it's partly for our benefit. You know, being, being associated with the king is a wonderful thing. But it's, it's infinitely more important for their benefit. Because if they don't see something different in us, then they can have everything. They, they, they can, there, there's nothing that draws them here. There's nothing that draws them to the gospel. They have to see that we are different. And that garment is what lumps us in with the king and his party. So to wrap up, we need to remember that being a Christian is not about self-identification. Okay, it's important to say, it's important to profess Christ. It is, that's a biblical truth. Profess Christ with your mouth. But it's much more important to be identified with Christ's mouth. Also, it's his party and it's his terms. So when we show up to this party, put on the robe. Put on the robe. And finally, when we put on that robe, we are putting on a robe that connects us to an infinitely important mission with high stakes, the highest stakes. There aren't stakes that are higher than this. We put on the robe in part for our benefit, 
But we put on the robe also for their benefit. So wear your robe, wear it proudly, keep it clean. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your sovereignty and, and that in spite of our lack of understanding or in spite of our uh, unwillingness to, to grow sometimes, that you provide everything we need and that you move us through um, the, the trials that we ha- we've, we've been um, handed, God. We thank you for your victory. We thank you for the cross and the gospel, God, that, that there's a party to attend. Uh, we thank you for the assurance of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, God. Embolden us, empower us to be uh, your servants so that we would have the courage to go out into the highways and the byways and to, and to model your wedding wear uh, with pride and with joy uh, and with the, with the fruits of the Spirit, God, so that they would look at us and they would glorify you. These things we pray in Jesus' mighty name.